Okay. Hey guys, got people coming in now. Where are you guys from? Yeah, give us a shout. Let us know. Everyone, oh, we got Dallas. That's right in the neighborhood there, Marla. <laughs> My name is uh, Jimmy Leslie. I'm the resident artist for, uh, for Liquitex. And today we've got an awesome teacher with us. You may have joined her in our last session. Marla Morrison is going to be leading you today in our, we're calling this Acrylic 102, right, Marla? Yep. Yeah, so she's going to be getting into some more varieties of Liquitex acrylics today. And then also remember to tune in the next two weeks uh, Marla, I think we're switching roles next time. You're going to moderate for me, and I'll be talking about Liquitex mediums. Um, a few things. Ask questions of us. I'm going to moderate for Marla. She is super knowledgeable. She's going to, uh, she'd be able to answer them all, I'm sure, but if she can, I'll weigh in as well. And between the two of us, we will tag team it. We're both educators and artists, so we love questions. We love to answer them. Uh, try to stump us today. Let's have a little fun with your questions. And uh, with that, Marla, I'll kick it off to you. All right. Thanks, Jimmy. I appreciate it. Yeah, I'm super excited that you guys are marking this election day with this demo. I know I'm going to remember this day for lots of reasons. So I'm um, happy we can spend this time together. And yeah, if you didn't have a chance to check out the Acrylic 101 demo, it's available at michaels.com and you can certainly do that. I'm going to give a little brief run through of uh, some of the higher points from that demo, but it's there if you want it or uh, need it afterwards. So Yes, I'll look forward to your questions and uh, we'll get started. I was hunching down because of my phone, but I think it'll be better now, okay. So acrylic paint, what is it? It's basically three components. You've got the color, which is the pigment, right? You've got the binder, it's a clear resin, it's a type of plastic, and then you've got water. Acrylics dry through evaporation and all that means is that water takes a hike out of that paint film and what you're left with is a very durable, flexible paint film. Okay, it's what you might also call a discrete paint layer because when that water evaporates, the, the uh, resin and the pigment migrate together and they interlock and that creates this nice, flexible, durable paint film. That's exactly what you want for long-term permanence when it comes to uh, any type of painting. But this is, a, so this is acrylic on its own. Obviously you can put acrylic on a surface, but I think this is a nice way to show how uh, user-friendly and durable acrylics can be, okay? Why talk about stuff like this? Well, I think it's important for one main reason, honestly. I mean, lots of reasons. Sometimes it's just interesting to figure out more about your materials. But I know for me, this process has been a lot about knowing how to better choose the materials I want to use in my studio. And so that's why Liquitex through Michaels has offered this, these two acrylic courses, and then Jimmy's gonna offer two more to kind of round it out. But the more you understand what your materials will and won't do for you, the more economical painting can be. You don't waste your money spending, spending it on things that eh, maybe you thought, hey, this is cool, it's on sale, I would do that. Or, oh, I like the name of this, uh, I'll try that. Sure, that's all fine to do you typically lose more money in the long run than if you just try it out based on some bit of you getting more educated and understanding the pigments that you're choosing and the materials that you're choosing. So glad you could be here with me to do that. In the first Acrylic 101, we talked about uh, three different series, one being the soft body acrylic, which I'll, we can see this a little closer. This was the first formulation Levison developed in 1955. And Mr. Henry Levison was the founder of Liquitex. He was already a rock star in the art materials industry prior to this, but we know him, or we talk about him mainly because of this uh, innovation of Liquitex, standing for liquid texture. And he created the first waterborne acrylic. This was the texture he developed. We now call it soft body. And you can see this, I really like our new packaging with the squeezable, easy squeeze bottle, the nozzle that you can cut to whatever aperture you want. But here is soft body. Right away, you can see that it's kind of a nice heavy cream texture. And it has fantastic covering power. Yeah. It's pre-filtered for use with airbrush and it's gonna hold a little bit of brush strokes, but not many. So it's a really good acrylic series. I think there's about a hundred colors in the range. 
And it's a great way to go if you like that more fluid kind of creamier paint texture. Now, if you're a painter, say an oil painter prior to this time, and you're like, hey, that's cool. I like the idea of having a water-based paint, but I'm not really digging that texture. You might wanna check out our heavy body. This is a second series I discussed in the um, Acrylic 101. I'll show it to you here. Comes uh, The whole range of 105 colors comes in a two ounce container and some come in this larger size. All of that info, by the way, is on our website or on the Michaels website, I would think too. But hopefully you can see right there that we've gone past a heavy cream te texture, right? It's much more of like a, eh, kind of like a peanut butter texture. Some people say toothpaste, but hey, it's better to talk about food, I think, so. <laughs> Marla, while you're yeah. starting that out, we actually have our first question that's come in. And, and also okay. just, just a shout, people from all over the country and someone from Israel as well. So, hey, yeah. thanks so much. Awesome. Yes, thanks for joining us. Wow, fantastic. So uh, the question uh, comes from Anne Marie in Washington. She says, how can I utilize the plastic nature of paints? Is there a surface I could paint on? Then lift the dry film. Then if I want to cut it up and add to a painting or other piece of art, how could I get it to adhere? Fantastic, yes. That's a yes to all that. <laughs> that durability of acrylics will adhere, well, the durability and flexibility mean that they adhere to just about any surface except for waxy, rubbery, oily, or non-porous ones. So you could use the paint just like this. The way you would make something like this, if that's kind of what you're asking, you need just like a slick surface. I make little samples on freezer paper. Um, you could do it on uh, glass since that's rigid and non-porous. You can apply it any way you want, but I find having some texture makes it easier to peel it up. So you just put the wet acrylic down on that non-porous or slick surface, let it dry, and then you're able to peel it up. And we have a really good resource on our site that goes into it in more detail. It's called our acrylic book. And I don't know what page, Jimmy, I don't know if you know offhand, but there is some information on making these acrylic skins, if that's what you're really, if that's part of what you're talking about. But there's another little tip to mention too, that if you are curious whether or not acrylics will stick to a particular surface you'd like to paint on, um, there's a quick adhesion test you can do. Just put the paint down on whatever surface you want. Maybe you have an interesting piece of metal you wanna paint on. If it's shiny, rough it up with sandpaper, put the paint down, let it dry, and then take in an inconspicuous area, take like a razor blade or whatnot and scratch to the surface. Then take some masking tape, rub it firmly and then slowly peel it up. And if you see paint coming off on your tape, that tells you you don't really have very good adhesion, okay? So that's kind of another, uh, I don't know if that helped answer your question, but those are kind of two things you can think about with acrylics and surfaces. Make sense? Jimmy, anything you wanna to add to that or you think that? No, I think you nailed that, Marla. Uh, and I'm going to add for everybody, I will put in the chat, everyone, I'm uh, doing that right now. There is a link to what Marla said uh, on the Liquitex website. So you can click on that link and it'll take you to downloadable resources like uh, color charts and the acrylic book that Marla was yeah. yeah, I love having those resources handy because, you know, you can call them up and print them out or whatever, but that's another way that you can just really be... Uh, more informed about your your choices with paint. So the heavy body, yeah, we'll get back to that. The heavy body, you can see how it's holding the knife stroke. You can definitely smooth it out like you can soft body. And hopefully you'll see this, I use the exact same color, quinacridone magenta. Hopefully you see that soft body is not a watered down version of heavy body. They're just formulated in such a way where heavy body allows the color to bunch up and be a bit more oil-like. Soft body is about smoother flow and, and covering power, among other things, okay? Heavy body dries a bit more slowly, so you get a little more working time. But it's really a matter of, okay, I'm, say you're working large scale and you wanna use professional color, you may wanna block in the large passages with soft body and finish in the textural work with your heavy body. And that way you're really taking advantage of these different series while sticking with professional color, okay? I was gonna mention real quick on this nice big tube that we do, uh, speaking of information, we try to put as much as we can without being obnoxious on our labels. So obviously you see our brand, you see the color series, this is heavy body acrylic. 
we've got trilingual in the color name. So this in English is quinacridone and magenta. And I think this is French and Spanish. Maybe they're flipped, I don't know. But here, this is a handy little number to be aware of. And I, I don't know if you guys can see it clearly. Maybe I'll raise it up a little bit, is that better? Okay, so this is our color index number. Okay, this is standard across the art materials industry. So say you're using a different brand of paint and you wanna to switch to Liquitex and your favorite red is cherry red. And you're like, oh man, I love it, but Liquitex doesn't have cherry red. What am I gonna do? Well, if you can get that color index number for cherry red, so, and maybe it's PR or standing for pigment red 122, if you can find that and come over to our colors and you say, hey, they have it, they just call it quinacridone magenta, then you know you have a pretty good side-by-side -side color match or hue match, okay? Hopefully ours will look you know, more brilliant and all because we have our pigment quality and everything, but that's the way you can match hue for hue between brands. This relates to our series information. Professional series, all our prof our prof the heavy body and soft body are priced in series. And so it's one to five, one being least costly, five being most costly. That has to do with pigments used and all the R&D and uh, process for obtaining the pigment and, and mixing it or milling it. This has to do with opacity and transparency. The white square means it's a transparent color. A black square would mean it's opaque. And this has to do with the pigment particle itself. Okay? Half black and white means it's semi-opaque or you could say translucent. And that can be helpful to know for different techniques like glazing or if you wanna paint thicker like impasto, that can be helpful. This little sun symbol uh, is a way to kind of notate our light fastness rating for the color. The Roman numeral one is our most permanent color. And just to give you an idea, we're talking about 100 years or more uh, longevity in museum conditions, which just really means in conditions that are protected from a lot of direct sun, good temperature, all that kind of stuff indoors, okay? Um, it's not as if on its 100th birthday, it's gonna switch from red to green. It's just that you may at that point be able to see some changes, but, but very minimal. All that to say too, even if you're working with murals using Artist color is gonna give you way more life than any hardware grade material is gonna give you. Because house paint, maybe you'll get a couple decades if you're lucky, um, but we're talking you know, still many, many decades uh, even for outdoor work. Here, this is our AP symbol. Uh, this is, I think, unless I'm wrong, I think all of our colors are AP, which stands for approved product. We used to say non-toxic, but people would ask if they could eat their paint and things like that. It looks delicious, but you don't wanna do that. But the idea of approved product is it means that it's been certified by independent toxicologists that it doesn't require any extra health and safety labeling like do not spray apply or whatnot. So that's just a good thing to know um, if you're conscious about that when choosing color. All of our labels will have some type of color representation and then of course sizing information, but that's, that's the heavy body tube. The, the other series we talked about in 101 is our basics acrylic. Um, it has the same label information. And basics is our everyday acrylic. And you can see texture wise, it's, it's probably closer to soft body color. Um, I, it will, it's not gonna hold the texture to the same degree that heavy body will. And this is the same quinacridone, quinacridone magenta. So you can see that basics holds up nicely to heavy body and soft body, but you can hopefully also see that maybe the pigment load isn't quite as heavy as it is in our professional series. Why do that? Why offer a range that um, doesn't have quite the pigment load per color? Well, there's a couple of reasons for it, but a lot of it goes back to the idea of economy. Um, when you're starting out, you wanna get an acrylic that you're not freaking out every time you squeeze out some paint, right? If you can squeeze out a little paint, and make your mistakes and, and enjoy the process without sweating how much it's costing. It's a really good way to go. All the colors and the size are at the same price point. And so that makes it very user-friendly to purchase as well. Um, but that said, even though it's our everyday acrylic, the price, uh, the quality of it is actually on par with many other brands, uh, artist range, if not better. So it's not that we're saying it's a, a you know, subpar range. It's just, it's, it's out there so you can get the color mixing and start to cut your teeth on acrylic without breaking the bank, all right? Marla, Marla um, we have a question related to your, your next uh, paint range there, acrylic wash. I'm gonna read that off and I'll, I'll uh, 
I'll just mention a quick answer and then you can fill in with anything. Um, that way you can lay that out. So the question was, can I use Liquitex varnish on regular gouache painting? So um, that, that question, uh, just a little bit tricky. When we say a regular gouache painting, um, I, I'm, I'm assuming, and I think Marla would assume that you're talking about uh, watercolor wash, an opaque watercolor, uh, which is uh, still water soluble when dry. You would not wanna brush apply a Liquitex varnish on that because you would end up lifting the color and smearing that. You could yeah. potentially spray a Liquitex varnish on there. However, the problem with that, it's gonna darken the colors uh, you're not going to be able to remove the varnish later on if you want without disturbing the paint. So uh, for, for a regular gouache painting, a, a watercolor gouache, we'd suggest you mat it and, and frame it to best protect it. But you can use Liquitex varnish on what Marla is going to talk about right now. Yes, that's, yeah. And that's one of the cool things about it is that it really uh, gives you more possibilities than a, tri a traditional gouache would. Not to say that you don't need that, but there are different reasons why, why you might choose one over another. So yes, the two series we're gonna focus on today, one is acrylic gouache, the other acrylic ink. You'll notice hopefully right away that it's very similar to soft body, except for one thing, right? The black cap. So just know that when you're at Michael's picking out color that the black cap means it's the acrylic gouache. Same, easy, nice, open. Cut the aperture on the nozzle to whatever uh, dimension or di diameter you want. And then here's wash. This is a teaser just to show it here. I'm gonna dive into it more deeply in a second. But you can see that again, quinacridone magenta, it's shiny, whereas gouache, when you think of gouache, it you want it to be velvety matte and opaque, right? It's shiny like the others because it's wet. When this dries, it's gonna be velvety matte. Okay, it might even dry by the time we're done. So if someone thinks of it, remind me and I'll show you. But uh, that's how it looks when wet. It's kind of that creamy texture again, but unlike um, basics or soft body, it really won't hold much knife or brush strokes. If I had a big pile of it here, it might keep it. But if I'm doing some brush stroking, what's really nice about it is it's gonna make it very flat and level. Okay, and last but not least is our acrylic ink. Uh, they, oh, I forgot to mention, that, oh, I'll tell you in a second. In our acrylic ink, um, this is a, just a wonderful range. It's probably one of my favorites, if I can say that. But uh, what I would say is when you get one of the bottles, be sure and shake it gently before use and give it a few squeezes. That's because these are pigment-based inks, not dye-based. And so you want to make sure that pigment is uh, nice and mixed up. And then as the name suggests, you can see how it's a very ink-like texture. Okay, so same color again. And like I said, this is just a teaser. We're gonna talk about it in more detail. But I wanted to show all of, the, all of these ranges together just to give you an idea that when you learn more about the different series, you can choose what you want depending on how you want to work. It's that concept of finding your flow with your artwork, okay? Marla, we have uh, someone, uh, Monira is asking, uh, is it good? I'm not sure if she was referring to a specific range you just uh, showed from, uh, but but let's just talk uh, acrylics in general. Is it good for glasses? I assume she's speaking of a, a drinking glass maybe. Oh, okay. Um, you know what? Uh, that goes back, if it's a plastic glass, acrylics will stick to plastics, but it's something where you may, you'd want to not paint the inside of the glass. You'd want to paint, um, the outside away from the lip that you know that you'd be putting to your mouth. If you're talking actual glass, acrylics aren't going to stick very well to that because they it's that slick non-porous surface, right? They you could uh, sandblast the glass and get you some adhesion, but usually for glasses that are going to be used, it's just not going to want to stick nicely through a lot of hand washing. So that's one situation where I wouldn't really recommend using a traditional acrylic on something like actual glass for permanent sake. Um, if it's just decorative, I suppose you could do it. Um, but again, if you picked at it, it would, it would come off. Does that make sense, guys? Okay. That does, Marla. We've also got someone asking uh, or saying that they paint on wood for holiday scenes yeah. that can be hung outdoors. And how will these paints stand up outdoors? Yeah, great question. 
So wood is a fine surface for acrylic. It's porous and um, you would just want to prepare it sufficiently. And so if it's, you know, just a random piece of wood you find, you want to probably do two to six coats of gesso. Make sure it's nice and dry. If the wood is, is damp or wet, you're going to want to let it dry out first. Um, if it's a piece of treated lumber or whatnot, again, gesso is a great idea. Um, the whole idea of gessoing for acrylics is really to protect the acrylic for, from any contaminants that might be in the wood. Uh, so a gesso, which is, is our primer, it's an acrylic primer. Um, it's basically, we have different ones, but it, it's just a way to block the surface from your paint, but still allow the paint to stick nicely to that wood surface. So after you gesso it, you can paint any of our acrylic series on top of the gesso uh, and let it dry. And if it's meant to be displayed outdoors, you'd want to apply a Liquitex varnish on top. And we have a whole range of those as well. Um, uh, Jimmy, I don't know how specific Marla, I should Jimmy. be. Um, I've yeah. made it. How you doing? Hey, Jimmy. Hey, technical problems. That's that's life in the uh, in the Zoom lane here. Hey, um, just so everyone's clear, a lot of this was re was recorded last week from 101. And we're going to advance a little bit because based on some of our timing into what she's pointing to right now is acrylic gouache. So lots of great questions, but know that this will be recorded as well. Available at michaels.com backslash classes. It'll be in the, in the feed. And Jimmy's here to answer um, your technical questions. He is our resident artist and head of the um, education program, if he hasn't already told you. So um, yeah, let's have some really, we had some really great dialogue last week. And um, you know, like I said, Marla's gonna introduce the acrylic wash and ink um, as part of this 102 series. So thanks everyone for joining. Thanks, Jeannie. So gouache, that's a pretty funny word, right? Um, I'm one of those people, I need to see it written to really wrap my head around it if it's something I wanna remember. And gouache is one of those words when I first heard it, I'm like, you're saying squash, what are you saying? So this is how <laughs> gouache is spelled. It's actually from the Italian word guazzo, which in Italian means mud. Now, I don't want you to think that our gouache is like mud, but the concept is it's just a very opaque, uh, densely pigmented, color series. But I thought it's fun to understand where that word comes from. I say it like this, uh, gouache, but you might hear other people say it goulash, which to me sounds like goulash, so I don't say it that way. But this is a, you might hear it said that way. So I just thought I, I would show that to you because it's just kind of one of those fun art words to have in your vocab. All right, so here's a printed color chart of our gouache. Uh, there's 50 colors in the range. If you, I don't know that you can see it that clearly, but if you look it up on our site, you'll see that all the colors are opaque or semi-opaque. And that is all based on super heavy pigmentation. Okay, we're just packing these colors with pigment. So it's our, it's our highly, most highly pigmented color series that we offer. So as you can imagine, that offers a lot of brilliance when you're working. Um, all of that same tech info is on here, but I just wanted to give you an idea of the colors we offer. Several yellows, reds, and blues, so you can have a variety of primaries. And I'm gonna do some mixing with the primary series now. So this is a, an acrylic gouache set and primary red, blue, and yellow. that makes it easy when you're starting out. If wash is interesting to you, but you're like, ah, oh, I don't know which yellow to pick. Just go for the primaries and practice with that. So here's the red and the blue. I'm gonna give you a violet. You can see I'm scraping back to get the undertone. You see the subtleties of the color, okay? And then Same idea here. Marla, can you just uh, move the, the uh, paint box? Um, oh, you're a little sorry. out of, you're out of, out of the, yeah, this, the shot there. Thank you. And we are getting lots of interesting questions, you know, last week as well. Um, you know, we're just, it's an extenuation of the 101. So there are a lot of questions and we're just really showing the, um, the commonality in the, um, between all the different ranges, particularly as it pertains to pigment. So that's what's really important. We want to and, uh, get that point across both with uh, what we're introducing today with the acrylic gouache and soon to be the ink. 
Yes, so this is the idea of the primaries. Um, and so again, that's a nice way to have a limited palette to start working with the gouache. And this is a chart that I have that shows it dry and nice and a little more detail, okay? Marla, I, I know, I know yeah. you're getting, a, um, you're going right to this. Uh, person's asking why use gouache over the other acrylics and uh, what the difference is between gouache and the other paint that you're showing, um, but I, I know you're headed towards that. Perfect question, perfect question. So this is a great sample to show that I think. Um, and Jimmy, I think you made these, I'm not sure, but this is a traditional gouache in a thick layer. So you can see with the traditional gouache, which is basically a lot of pigment, typically some opa white opacifiers added, but not always. Um, and uh, gum arabic. Uh, gum arabic is the sugar that helps. Sorry, my dog is making a noise here. <laughs> gum arabic is the sugar that uh, keeps it in and um, keeps it in the tube and stable. Um, you can see that when you apply gouache in a thick layer, you guys see that you can see that cracking that you're going to get. Acrylic gouache gives you that velvety matte look, but absolutely no cracking. Okay. You can apply it, you can see it's thicker texture here and you can see that it's not cracking. Again, that goes back to that clear resin binder. It's durable and flexible and it's not gonna get funky on you if you wanna do texture. So that's one reason why you might wanna choose an acrylic gouache over traditional. Um, another reason might be you like the flow that acrylics can offer. This is the primary red, just one stroke on the surface. And you can see how it just gives you a little bit more flow out of one brush stroke. Traditional gouache, it's a little bit choppy. And so you're a lot of back and forth to the, um, to the palette to pick up your color. So that's something that's nice about our acrylic gouache is that it has a really nice flow to it. And you don't have to add water to get that. It comes out of the container with this really nice flow. Another reason you may want to choose uh, an acrylic gouache over traditional has to do with the ability to cleanly layer colors. This is the traditional gouache and primary blue with cadmium orange on top. And you can see with one stroke applied, it got muddied because uh, traditional gouache, just like watercolor, re-wets in, per in per perpetuity, right? You could have a gouache painting that's been there for 20 years. You come back with some water, you can re-wet it. Okay. With acrylics, once it's dry and once it's created that stable paint film, you're not going to re-wet it, even if you wanted to. Okay, It's going to be a very permanent paint film. You can put that uh, lighter value, that orange on top, and it's not going to get muddied up like it did here. So that's a really nice attribute of the acrylic gouache that you may be uh, interested in. And then this, I think, is good to show... Um, how it looks compared to dry a dry sample of soft body. This is, I don't exactly know which color, I didn't make this, but it's probably that quinacridone magenta or something similar. That is so awesome. we're, okay, you made, yeah, cool. So you're, we're obtaining that opacity through that heavy pigment load. So both colors are beautiful, but now you're seeing the natural transparency pigment characteristics in the soft body. Whereas here you're seeing that really boosted pigment load gives you the velvety texture, visual texture and that opacity while being in a similar hue. It's not exactly the same, but it's similar, right? So that's kind of a nice side-by-side -side comparison on the black and white background. Uh, give you an idea of that. And then this shows a uh, traditional gouache with our Liquitex heavy body in a smooth layer. And then this is, uh, is the cadmium free orange. This is a traditional cadmium. This is our new cadmium free and our acrylic gouache cadmium free. So this is a nice piece to show how um, not only do our, do our cadmium free colors look nice and opaque as a true cadmium should, but you can see some of the sheen difference, hopefully maybe this isn't, between heavy body and it's probably too hard to see it's pretty subtle but you'll see some sheen difference between heavy body and acrylic gouache but the, you'll notice in both traditional and the acrylic gouache that they have that velvety matte sheen 
But this is really to kind of showcase our cadmium free colors, which I wasn't going to spend a lot of time on. But if you have questions, I'm happy to help. Or I'm sure Jimmy could help. Totally easy. Yeah, Marla, I'm actually going to uh, audibly answer something. We were getting some questions yeah. in that I'm uh, I'm writing in. But since this is coming up over and over for everyone, the yeah. acrylic wash that Marla is showing, that's going to be something you want to choose if you're an artist who wants the most opaque paint that you can get out of the Liquitex ranges uh, that it's the most matte paint. So if you like uh, a matte finish, or let's say you're someone who shoots a photo, this is always me, I shoot a photograph of, um, of my piece and if it's too shiny, it can be really hard to get a, a nice clear photograph without high spots and glares and things like that. So the yeah. acrylic wash can be a great choice for, for those reasons. Yeah, that's a great point. I've, yeah, and I, I wanted to mention, and it just slipped my mind that, yeah, the, the tradition of gouache had been for uh, photography for that reason, like fashion designers and interior decorators would paint out their illustrations in gouache, and, and because it was velvety and matte, it wouldn't give any hot spots for photography. But uh, yeah, now artists have capitalized on that beautiful velvety matte color, and they can enjoy it. Yeah, like Jimmy said, they like the matte sheen with that really dense opacity. Okay. Yeah, and, and you know, to add to what Marla's saying there, so if you just quickly run across the ranges there, your soft body, it's gonna flow really well. It was often used by muralists early on. Uh, so it flows really, really well and uh, very little brush strokes. Heavy body, you probably choose that if you like a thicker impasto brush stroke. Ink, if you like ink qualities, you wanna work with pen and ink or brush and ink, you choose ink and then acrylic gouache again if you want something very matte and something uh, very opaque. Uh, but Keep in mind, uh, we're talking about acrylic gouache here, not your watercolor gouache, which is gum Arabic based. You wouldn't want to mix those two or use them together. Uh, two different binders, two different types of paint. These are all acrylics, which is why they're all compatible. Okay. All right, so you know what? Um, yeah, this just shows that cadmium free orange in a tint with titanium white. And so just know that you can do a lot of cellar, subtle color mixing with the acrylic gouache as well. Um, and, and color tinting, it, it, it tones down or, or goes into the tint quite nicely. And I'm going to show some painting with it right now. Um, so I am not, <laughs> well, I'm not even gonna go there. I work in different ways, but I found it fun to do little landscape studies to kind of show off some of these colors. And an easy way for me to do it is take a photograph and then pick the series I wanna work with and see what I can do in a fairly short amount of time. So I thought it would be fun to quickly show um, adding some lighter tones to this landscape base with the gouache. Obviously we have a white and since this is monochromatic I only need to get the titanium white and phthalo blue and add some of this highlighting here and this has been dry just you know for an hour or so but you can see that that really allows me to paint on top of it nicely without any of that muddying or picking up the color that's already in place. I'm just kind of pouncing with the brush here. Um, say I wanna try and get that uh, lightning bolt up here. So I'm gonna use my filbert brush and turn it on its edge. And I'm just gonna kind of, you know, gently kind of bounce it in. I don't, I'm not interested in trying to capture this perfectly because uh, you know, it's just not my thing, but, you know, I'm definitely impressed by people who can do it. I just am trying to get kind of the feel of this image without trying to have it be an exact representation. But you can see how that beautiful titanium white just kind of pops on that um, wash blue. Feather some of that in there. And Mario, while you're doing that, I'm gonna jump in on a question here that says, uh, uh, Anne-Marie says, I have a, a set of the Liquitex acrylic gouache. My palette tends to dry faster than I paint. Any tips on what to do to give myself a little bit more painting time before my palette uh, paints dry? 
Yeah, we, we have a product. It's called a Liquitex Palette Wetting Spray. And basically it's your acrylic polymer in a mist form. So you can use that to spritz it. You can actually spritz it on your palette and then lay out your paints. So they're sitting on a, a light film of it. And then you could spritz on top of it as well. And that won't really change the characteristics of the paint, but it'll help your paint be more flexible and, and dry a bit slower as well. And you might ask, well, why not do that with water? The palette wetting spray will evaporate uh, it, uh, less fast than water will, so it'll, it'll give you that open time so they don't dry out on your palette. So yeah, thank you, Jimmy. Yeah, that's yeah, great. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. So you can see how this goes, right? Um, you can do something really quickly because of that nice uh, speedier drying time. But yeah, if you don't like it, the, how quickly it dries, just get the palette wetting spray um, to help. And you can also add like humidifiers or things like that to your studio to slow it down a little bit if you wanted. But um, yeah, it's just a really uh, fun and quick way just to sketch out your ideas. So, you know, I could keep going, but I don't wanna, you know, I'll get lost in it and then Jimmy will just have to do the rest of it because I'll be painting and <laughs> so I'm gonna move on now, but. And Marla, I'm yeah, just reminding everyone, the question came in uh, right now that you're using the acrylic wash, not the soft body at, at this moment. Right. That was the acrylic wash, yes. And you can certainly, I'll show this one to mention, you know, you can certainly add mediums to our acrylic wash because yes, it is an acrylic paint. So it's fully compatible with all of our acrylic mediums. This is a turquoise deep acrylic wash with our gloss medium. You can see that it's going to get, it's gonna take away that velvety mat, give you a gloss sheen, but uh, be aware that the more medium you add to the color, the more transparent it will become but that's a way that you can use that dense, highly pigmented gouache and add sheen to it if you choose. You could also varnish with a gloss varnish if you like that look too on the gouache. All right. Hi everyone. Hey Marla and Jimmy again. Uh, yeah, Jimmy's getting some really interesting questions. Uh, it seems like there's a lot of great questions about acrylic gouache. Um, someone, it, we do have all this information on the Liquitex website. Um, we'll put that out in the chat for you. Um, but more importantly, that we're going, this class is being recorded. For those of you that are joining us late or, you know, there will be um, in 24 hours, it'll be posted on michaels.com backslash classes. So I encourage you to do that. There's also 101 that Marla did last week. And Jimmy, who's joining us this way to moderate, will be teaching next week with acrylics. So want to just give you a teaser on that. There's some really interesting acrylics that we're going to be introducing. And... Um, Marla just touched on it a little bit, but let's get into some of the ink because that's another great uh, uh, medium that uh, can convey the rest of the uh, pigment story that we want to talk about. Yeah, so if this is about searching out the different paint mediums and finding what really kind of rings your bell, so to speak, um, I, I think it's good to, to kind of go through all the textures and the ink as it, it's an acrylic paint, but we call it an ink because of that super fluid flow that it has. It can do just about anything a traditional ink could do. You can use it in a dip pen. You can obviously use it with brush. You can um, spray apply it. You wanna wear a mask when doing that. About the main things I can think of that you don't wanna do with the inks is you don't wanna fill your printer cartridge with it because it's not that kind of ink. And you also don't wanna tattoo with it. I actually got a call one time from someone who had already done it and wondered why his arm was uh, red and infected. I said, uh, don't call me, go call your doctor <laughs> and don't use our acrylic inks for that. They're good for lots of things, but not tattooing. So um, you can do almost any ink thing you want, except for those two things. You can even put them in like uh, reservoir pens, like calligraphy pens or a uh, rapidiograph. Just make sure that you drain the reservoir before you store it, okay? Color chart, you're seeing the actual color here, which is nice. Um, we talked about it in 101, mask tone versus undertone. Again, these are pigment-based inks, not dye-based. So they follow natural pigment characteristics. Some like the cerulean blue hue is gonna be more uniformly opaque. Whereas the thalo, uh, thalo green here is gonna have a mask tone that's darker than the undertone. And you're gonna see some subtle differences between those two. 
Okay. There's 35 colors in the range, a couple of metallic or a few metallics, and then uh, white and a lovely carbon black. The whole range is light fast for artist use. And that's why it's a big deal that it's pigment based and not dye based. Dyes are going to fade pretty rapidly, probably in our lifetime, if not sooner, especially if exposed to a lot of UV light. Pigments, their structure is different. They hold up to UV bombardment and they don't break. And so we don't see it as fading. So this is a really great series if you want inks and you want it to be permanent. I love to use the inks on watercolor paper. And by the way, you, I'm just throwing around color here because it's fun and I can. Um, <laughs> Uh, so don't feel like you've got to take note of exactly which colors I'm using, but um, if you wanted to know, I can tell you, this is the quinacridone magenta, this is turquoise deep. Um, I like to use watercolor because, I, I like to use watercolor for the inks because they just have a lovely way of kind of embedding themselves into the paper. It doesn't mean that you can't use canvas. It just, for some reason, I just really like how they live together on the surface. Um, even though it's razor thin, this is still an acrylic paint film and it's still going through that uh, binding process that we talked about in the beginning where those uh, that resin base is kind of marrying with the pigment and creating that nice stable paint film, okay? Why might you wanna use inks? Well, it's obviously excellent for detail work, um, in 101, I mentioned that acrylics can be watercolor-like. So if you're a watercolor painter and you like um, that kind of behavior of paint, but you want to stick with acry acrylics, or maybe you're working with acrylics on the same surface, or you want a watercolor effect on the same surface as an acrylic painting, that way you can use the inks and have that acrylic uh, paint on the entire thing while not having to put a watercolor on an acrylic painting. It's gonna have that nice durability that acrylics do. Um, it's not going to re-wet like watercolor it would. So when, it, it would probably re-wet now because it's not fully cured. But if I had a dry uh, bit of acrylic ink, I wouldn't be able to re-wet it because it creates that nice stable pink film, okay? Um, this is that watercolor idea here. This was the acrylic ink with our airbrush medium, which is one of the mediums Jimmy may or may not talk about, I don't know, but it's a really lovely medium to use with the inks. Very watercolor washy effect. And then I just used a dip pen here to with the carbon black and did the drawing. So some people might look at this and just say, this is a drawing, right? Well, it's still using acrylic paint. Added some of the ink uh, color here. And then I finished out with some soft body in one of our glam colors, the interference red, to get that kind of sparkle on the dragonfly wings, right? Um, this is a little quick study I did to show the inks in, I don't know, to me more of a spontaneous fashion. This is wet on wet with the inks. So again, watercolor-like, but thicker. I didn't wash it down with water or medium. This is just straight from the bottle. And you can see that lovely white, how it still will stand up against the surface um, from the rest of the, the colors. Um, I left some of the white of the paper also, but just brushing it out and uh, working with that really brilliant ink color. That's something that blows me away. You can have a tiny bottle of ink and it will last a long time. I don't know what it is. It's like the never ending bottle or something, but you don't need a lot to get a really powerful amount of color. So know that about the inks. Thank I think so much ink... Marla about, about just that, yeah. that paint film, right? With, with ink, you're using such a thin layer of it, just like, uh, just yeah. like watercolor. You're, you're right. They seem to go uh, so much further than, than a thick layer of paint that you might be, uh, might be painting out. Yeah, it's, it's just, it's kind of amazing to me. But another really fun attribute of the inks is that to me, they're very um, chameleon-like. And what I mean by that is they will, they will integrate into all sorts of different things. I'm not gonna spend time on all these individual mediums because that's what Jimmy's gonna do on some level. But the idea here is I took the same percentage of ink with the same percentage of medium. And you can see how that one color can look very different depending, depending on what you put it with. Because it's so fluid, it's not going to obscure the texture of the different mediums you may put it in. So that's another thing I really love about the inks is that it's almost like you become the, 
the color maker, the texture maker, because you're just adding it to whatever other attribute you want to include it into. Hey, Marla, a couple questions. I know, Jimmy, you're probably going to jump on this as well, but people are asking about ink, like what are some of your preferences in terms of the tools that you're using? Um, you could refer sure. to wet on wet. So if you could elaborate a little bit on that. Sure. So uh, on this, this sample, I just use uh, these two brushes, our Liquitex Freestyle, which I think I mentioned before in the other video, but um, it's a synthetic filament brush. And wet on wet is simply where you take the actual color. And by the way, I like to use these little wells for the ink um, rather than like a flat palette because it would just spill everywhere. So this is just a cheapy little, um, what's the word, a plastic palette. <laughs> And I'll just put my color in there. And Marla, you're using uh, are you using 140 pound uh, cold press paper right now, watercolor paper? Yes. Yes, yeah. this is a Winsor Newton uh, 140 pound cold press. Exactly. You got it. So you can do all the color mixing you'd want to do, you might want to do with any other acrylic. Again, it's, it's, it's really an acrylic paint, just an ink texture, okay? So you can mix however you'd like, um, wet on wet. So say I have an area here, I'm getting it wet here. I'm going to add another color to it while it's wet, right? I'm just dropping it in while it's wet. I don't know if you can see that with the sheen, what's wet, what's not. Um, I can do it here too. You know, I, I think Marlo, that kind of reminds me seeing you do that. I, I, I feel like working wet into wet, and I don't know if you feel differently, but you know, it's almost something to just uh, sit and play with a little bit, even before you work on a finished piece, just to see what happens when you drop one color in another and the, the beauty of those two naturally mixing together. Yes. Yes, that's exactly right. Yeah, I mean, some things work, like that's kind of an interesting neutral color, but hey, it's not super, super vibrant now because I've muddied it up a little bit, but you can see how the way they'll bleed together can be really, I don't know what the word like, I can zone into that pretty nicely. <laughs> it's like the the painting, just because you like how, how, it, how it looks as you're going, not worrying too much about trying to replicate anything in particular. You're just kind of getting into that flow of the material. Um, so I, I like these wells quite a bit. I, I have water over here that I'm dipping my brush in and I can't see the water well, but that's all it is. I'm just cleaning my brush in between. Um, a fun technique that you can do with inks is stamping. You know, if you have a bunch of these kind of stamps around, you can just take your brush, paint it on top. And the whole idea for everyone of, of working wet into wet as well is that you're getting you're getting very subtle blending with that. So you'll get soft transitions, like if you're if you're moving from uh, you know a darker part of the sky up top down to the horizon line and such. It's a, it's a really nice way to get those transitions. Sure. So since rubber is not a surface acrylics like to stick to, um, any old uh, any type of stamp that you may have should work pretty well just painting the ink on top. It may not be as crispy and uh, as a traditional rubber stamp would be. And I needed to press more in the center, but you can see how if you practice with it, you can get more of the detailing. And you know what? It really kind of just depends on how you wanna, how you wanna work with it. Maybe you come back in and add color to it on your own, you know? Um, so it could just be a way to kind of flesh out a certain, idea or design. And then inks come off really easily and nicely from that stamp. Um, there's another one I could show. This is just ink as the background. And then I just made my own little stamps and I've got some white ink, the titanium white acrylic ink. Shake it and squeeze it. Take a different brush, throw my brush around a little bit. <laughs> And then again, just paint that stamp. So this is a little bit kind of a, a rougher stamp, but you get the idea. Well, that's an, another fun way that you could just build up different texture. Um, 
I don't know, make cards for people, who knows? But the acrylics, the inks, just lend themselves to a lot of different surfaces and possibilities, techniques. So that's one other technique. Um, and inks are fantastic on fabrics. This is a raw canvas with the ink painted directly on the surface, just using a brush. You can see that it doesn't change the texture. The inks really integrate nicely into whatever surface you put them on, whether it's canvas or paper um, or any other type of fabric. Like this is silk. This is just a silk blank. I did not thin it with anything. I just used it straight out of the container, out of the bottle. You don't have to heat set the inks. So you just lawn, you let it dry for 72 hours if possible. And then you just launder for whatever the fabric wants. So with silks, you want to hand wash it. So you just hand wash it. I've hand washed this many times. And, you know, it's a, the inks are very nice permanent color in there. Absolutely no fading or weird bleeding has happened since they've been dry. Nope, there's no color bleeding. I saw that pop up. No color bleeding. This is just my brush stroking. Again, my kind of <laughs> not my imprecise brush, brush stroking, but yeah, that's on silk. And, and Marla, I just typed in the chat for everybody, but uh, uh, just, to, just to clarify, if you're on Instagram, uh, check us out at Liquitex Official. We do uh, monthly hour long live streams on a variety of topics and, and they're all archived there. So some of this stuff has gone over in, in, uh, in some detail there. So you can check that out in addition to these great videos uh, at Michael's. And also we have our education program at TFAC. And A, there's also other uh, other mini, oh, there you go, Marla's got it. She's, on <laughs> she's in charge. <laughs> Thanks, Marla. Yeah, no, and I was to the end, unless, unless there's questions, but yeah, the ink on fabrics is super fantastic. Um, Liquitex.com has the color charts and other wonderful technical information. This is what Jimmy was talking about, our fine art collective group. Um, lots of fabulous demos that um, he'll do on there and just a, a resource for technical information. Here's me. If you want to check out more of what I do and more of my work, I'd love to see you there. Um, if you are inspired to make anything with any of these series, feel free to post it with the hashtag Liquitex Find Your Flow. That's something that um, we'd like to see what you make with any of these color series. And then this is the, my little messed up ampersand, but <laughs> this is the at Liquitex official that, that Jimmy mentioned. So. Hey Marlo, um, we, we've got a few yeah. minutes left and, uh, and there's a, a question that just came in um, about gesso. I, I'm not sure I understand the question exactly, but it says, what is medium gesso in, in Liquitex? I, I think maybe just a clarification of what gesso is possibly. Okay. Yeah, gesso is something that you'll hear for oil color as well. Um, and we use it for acrylics uh, to prime the surface and prepare it. Same is true for oil. Oils need it to keep them from damaging the surface. Acrylics are pH neutral when dry, so you don't have to use gesso for that reason. But you may want to use that gesso or primer to prepare the acrylic to sit nicely on the surface. I mentioned with wood that there can be contaminants in it that you may want to put the gesso down first, let it dry, and then do the acrylics. Um, but gesso is basically, my understanding, uh, is that it's that acrylic binder with a heck of a lot of um, titanium white for the white gesso, and the non-crystalline silica that gives it a slight toothiness or that feel that uh, allows the paint to grip nicely to the surface. Because when you feel a gesso, you want it to have a slight toothiness or uh, abrasion feel to hold on to your paint. So I don't know if that answered it, but that's why you may want to use a gesso. I find another reason you may want to use gesso with acrylics is economy again. If you've got a really absorbent surface like wood or a paper and you don't want to have it sink into the surface, put a layer of gesso down and then the color will sit nicely on top of it without getting lost in the substrate. Okay. Yeah, and one thing I would add to that everyone, I, I just posted a link uh, to one of my favorite and I'm going to be talking about uh, mediums and Although not technically a medium, I'm going to talk about gesso next week. One of my favorite is clear gesso because you can put it over something. So if you're doing like uh, mixed media work, you could put clear gesso over something like a, a page out of a magazine that you otherwise wouldn't be able to draw on because it would be too slick, it'd be too waxy. And the clear gesso will give it enough tooth to be able to draw with charcoal, pencil, pastel, yet you'll still see the image uh, underneath. And uh, there's also a question, somebody says, how can I see the last class? Uh, visit the Michaels website and go to classes and then you can see Marla's class from last week. Everything's archived 
So that's really uh, an awesome thing about the Michaels site. You know, if, if there's anything you want to go back to that Marla covered today or last week, you can kind of do that and uh, at your own pace. Hi everyone. Yeah. I just want to, I, I see we're wrapping up. Um, I just wanted to give, this is like the BAU, here we have the technical things that Jimmy just mentioned. Um, everything is available. We, we encourage you to view it like anything else. This is um, one, um, this is the, the acrylic color class, but it's, uh, these are, there will be four altogether of which we mentioned Jimmy will be going into greater detail on liquid, liquid text acrylic mediums and how they interact with, with all these colors and all these different mediums that we've shown you today and from the 101 class. So um, I would encourage you, to, uh, we look down www.liquidx.com for all these great details on the Michaels website as well. Um, obviously reach out to Marla. Um, always, you know, anything of great creations or you feel creative you want to share with us, um, hashtag make it with Michaels, hashtag Liquitex find your flow. <laughs> Um, so thank you all for joining. Um, we're going to have Jimmy, who's going to be presenting next week, not moderating. And uh, we're going to have a lot more to come after that. So you will be seeing Marla. Please, um, I encourage you to do your survey because it will help us curate and offer classes that you're interested in. So once again, thank you all for joining us. Thanks to Michaels for hosting thank us. You. And uh, Marla, thank you. Thanks a lot. Jenny. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Yeah, someone asked last minute about silk. Yeah, this is the one on silk. So you can certainly do it on silk. Do things on silk. <laughs> thanks, guys. Yep, Appreciate thanks it. And have a good day. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you.